The following talk by Katja is going to be introducing some railway-specific protocols like GSMR and others. Listen to why, ra why railway is safe but not secure by Katja. Stage is yours. Hi, thank you. Um, it's great to see that so many people are actually interested in the topic of railway security. As I was asked lately, um, is there even security like in the railway system? And yes, there is. It's just that most of the things are locked up in like big companies and not all of it is easily accessible. So I'm going to talk about things I learned during my industry experience and during my time as a researcher, where I had the luck to be able to speak to a lot of railway engineers. Okay, some disclaimers first. Someone asked me whether the um, two people on the first slides are actually me and my dad. They're not. So I feel obliged to mention that most similarities to people living or dead are purely coincidental. Then um, most of the claims I do are based on anecdotes, what people said to me. Um, so it's not like real evidence. And um, you will not learn how to hack a train. Sorry, that talk was yesterday if you missed it. Uh, Okay, so railway network. Um, let's start with the basics. What do we need? Uh, we have a train. And there is actually a lot of equipment inside the train, but I also referenced the talk from yesterday. The guys did a pretty good job uh, and explained what you expect there. So I'm more uh, interested in the trackside equipment. So if you look out uh, on, a, on a railway journey, you look outside, you see some light signals, uh, you can see some points, you can see a level crossing. And if you look a little bit closer, you'll see a lot of these yellow boxes in the tracks, besides the tracks. They can actually, for example, detect a train. And what you can't see is um, that what they are connected to, so interlockings who actually determine um, whether the point should switch or the light uh, is, is providing the indication to the driver that he can move on. And then, like in the near future, whatever that means for railway, um, we're also going to have more wireless communication. So, like the Actually, the maximum um, speed of a train is limited uh, by the driver being able to still recognize the light signals. So if you can just send that directly to the train in a safe manner, you could also increase the maximum speed, and that would like be a really nice feature. Okay. But what happens if we actually say to a railway engineer, you need to get sicher? We want to do. You, uh, we want to have Sicherheit. Well, the railway engineer most likely will respond. We have been doing this for 150 years, and the problem is that we here have a misunderstanding. And English helps. So in English, we have two terms. We have safety, and we have the term security. So what's the difference? Safety actually means that we want prevent. Uh, we want to prevent the system under consideration, here or said train, to harm the environment. And security means we want to prevent the environment from influencing the train. So that means the guy in the back with a laptop playing around with a point, leading or crane to trash. Uh, uh, crash. Well, then it's trash. Okay, so both terms are actually also not what I'm looking for. for. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to speak about rail security. This is not an established term. I just say, I, I'm just going to call it that way uh, and not to be mixed up with uh, some company in America. 
America also does everything different about trains. So, rail security. What do I mean by rail security? We want to ensure the secure operation of the railway system and thus enabling the safe operation of the railway system. So actually, safety is our main goal and security here is a tool. So, why can't we? I mean, we haven't had any big crashes in Germany, um, so why can't we just stick to how railway has been operating over the last 150 years? And so far, the security that railways are providing is based on processes. So, I really like this picture because it has this phone and that uh, very old interlocking with the levers. So, you need a lot of phones because people are talking forth and back via protocols. So actually people are following protocols like a computer and it sounds a little bit ridiculous if you hear it for the first time, but that's how they ensure the safe operations. But we are now moving to more standardized interfaces because currently like everything looks a little bit different. And that's quite expensive because you have everything in hardware and every time you have another project that needs to be reconfigured. So we're now moving to more, towards more standardization, towards more interconnection, and so we're broadening the attack surface. Okay, then why don't we just use IT security as we know it? Well, in IT security, we often rely on limiting the access to a network. To achieve safety, we want to have a fallback option. We want to have redundancy. We have several connections. For security, we want to do a lot of updates if we find out our system is not secure anymore. For safety, that doesn't work either because we have standards and these standards have a lifetime of 30 years. So like they're being discussed in the 90s, then they come into, um, uh, they are going to be active 10 years later, and then you build a system which will be in the field 30 to 50 years. So we have a really, really long lifetime. So this is kind of contradictory, but um, yeah, it's moving forward. Okay, so first steps first, we need to convince railway engineers that they actually need to do security. And the first thing you usually encounter when you talk to a railway engineer is, we have always done it like this, we don't need this. I call it security by denial. <laughs> and as I've heard a variant lately, which was, oh, I think security at railway, that's just a hype topic, it will go away. Okay, everyone has their opinions. Um, and then there was another reasoning, uh, which was quite nice. Someone said, oh, I think we're just lucky because hacking a train is not as sexy as hacking a plane. So we have security by unsexiness. <laughs> Let's look at the data. So these are just some of the texts you easily find when you Google railway attack news. Um, I mean, big ones, of course, WannaCry is in there, I think everyone knows that. Um, and the first three are actually real IT security attacks. We have ransomware in Germany, Sweden, and Italy. But they all just affected the ticketing system. So they're not like real rail security attacks we're looking for, but just the system around. Then we had sabotage and the emergency stop in August. Um, they were actually affecting the operations, so trains stopped. But you couldn't really call that an IT security attack because sabotage is just cutting cables and the emergency stop was jamming signals. Um, there also was a DDoS attack and that seems uh, that it actually affected um, the, the operations, so they needed to stop. So that one might classify as a railway, uh, secu uh, as a rail security attack. And um, well, I don't know how to classify fixing a train. Also, uh, well, hacking a train—the one you heard yesterday—because, um, but you also find it if you look for attacks. 
Okay, so I think security band sexiness doesn't hold. Uh, people are interested in attacking the network. Okay, then what people also tell you is, but nobody can access our network anyway. It's closed. We don't need to do anything. I call that security by the tail of the closed network. <laughs> and well, I already mentioned the Poland emergency stop, um, where 20 trains stopped and they were just jamming the system. And actually, um, the, uh, trans uh, the, the wireless transmitting system here is so old that they could really just jam the system and the train stopped. So not really much effort required. So I don't believe in the tail of the closed network, but uh, yeah, people do. Next thing we encounter, because uh, as I said before, standardization is um, something you use to achieve safety, is uh, that they say it's secure because it's standardized. And for that one, we want to look at a concrete example. So, we want to look at ERTMS, ETCS, the European Train Control System, which is being standardized, and that's, for example, controlling um, in, in ULANGs the connection between the radio plug center, sending out movement authorities to the train. So that could actually tell the train, you need to do an emergency stop or you can go forward for the next 10 kilometers at speed something something. So several layers, we have GSMR, Euro Radio, and the application layer. And then there's something else I encountered by trying to read all this documentation, which is several thousand of pictures, and you try to find something in there. I call it security by paper. It's really annoying. Luckily for me, um, there's a nice paper uh, from Chacha et al, and they explain an attack against the stack, and I want to explain at least parts of this attack to you. And this attack is already six years old, so it's uh, really old. Okay, so um, as I said before, we have uh, the stack, we have underlying GSMR, which is providing some encryption. Uh, why do I say some? Because GSMR is GSM for railway, and it's basically GSM. Um, and there are enough attacks about GSM, so yeah. Uh, then in Euroradio, we have a message authentication code. We will look at that later. And then on the application layer, European Train Control System, uh, we can send out the movement authority or emergency stop, for example. So emergency stop is also a movement authority. So how does the attack work? First, you uh, read the GSMR communication. Then you need to attack and decrypt that. Um, then you need to find collisions. So like for the Mac, I just showed you. Then you can recover part of the Euro radio key. And then you can produce your forged message. So I'm actually interested in the recover part of the Euro radio key. Okay, so let's look how that looks like. So the Mac is done by Triple DS. That's actually nice. I mean, NIST says it's only uh, valid for, for legacy products until uh, 2023, but I mean, we can say that's a legacy product, so it's still not dep deprecated for the next five days. Um, but anyway, Triple DS is, is not so bad. Okay. So let's look at that Mac and let's look at this um, message. So this is an example message how the acknowledgement message from a train could look like. Um, time is in there, the length, some padding, um, the types. And then to calculate the Mac, it's actually broken into four <clears throat> into two 64-bit uh, blocks and it's triple DS with um, um, uh, CBC mode. Um, sorry, I explained that in a, in a sec. So, what you expect is that each block is actually encrypted by triple DES, and then it's XORed with the next block, and then you do another triple DES. 
So that's what you expect. That's not what's happening because for the first n minus one blocks, so in my example it's just one, but could be more, they just use triple DES with K1, 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 which is basically DES with K1. Um, and that's a problem because DES is not secure, especially not with 64 bits. So, next step of the attack was we want to find a collision. What happens if we find a collision? So, we now have two messages who produce the same MAC. And then we make the assumption that the collision is not happening um, during the triple DS round in the end, but before. And then we get the equation, um, well, that equation, I'm not going to read it out. And we already know all the messages because we uh, were able to decrypt uh, GSM. And um, there's only one unknown value, uh, and that's the K1. So we can now brute force the 64 bits of K1, and that should take us a few days. And we have part of the Euro radio key, and that can be used for uh, producing a forged message. So let's talk about the feasibility of that attack. I think that part I just showed you is pretty feasible. Um, and I hope you believe me just from following the slides. Finding a collision, the authors of the paper, so I'm mostly talking about uh, what they are presenting, um, they already did some estimates. Um, sorry. Um, so they estimated that you, or not estimates, calculations, um, that you need around 10 to the power of eight messages. And with a 1% chance, you can do, find them in 45 days and 50% chance of eight years. So why do I think that's relevant? Because um, as I said before, we're moving into uh, the area where we have more communication, wireless, more standardization. So we're broadening our, our attack surface and we're sending out more messages. So my guess would be that will become quicker because we will have more messages in the network. Okay, then we have uh, GSMR and uh, GSM. Um, yeah, so that's basically GSM, f one encryption, that's broken, there are a lot of attacks out there. Um, I think it's also feasible to, to do that and that was also shown in the paper's proof of concept. And for producing a MAC for the movement authority, that's a little bit more complicated, and if you're interested in that, I refer to the paper due to the uh, time. Okay, so security by standardization. In principle, that's a really nice idea, um, but we have a problem if we fix our crypto algorithms in there, and if we don't allow for change. So you need to have the option to say, okay, we know that algorithm is not secure anymore and we need to switch to a newer one. And especially in this standard, um, it is even like hard written. It's not just use triple DES as standardized by someone else, but they specified how it needs to be implemented. Okay, let me tell you another story. Five years ago, uh, I went to Intertrans, so if you're interested in rail, go to Intertrans, really nice. You can talk to people, and there was a really nice guy with a box. And this box was pretty secure. And we asked, hey, cool, so why is it secure? And he said, we have two keys. And he showed us the two keys. <laughs> So we said, no, no, it, it says here you're doing cybersecurity, so what are you doing? And he said, uh, oh, sorry, that's security by a second lock. So then we asked for cybersecurity, and then we said, we will add security later. <laughs> I call that security by futurization. <laughs> and I also have an example for that. So we're going to look at the Rasta protocol. Um, it's the Rail Safe Transport Application Protocol. It has two layers. Um, it's communicating 
between the interlocking and the track side equipment, for example. Um, and the layers are, okay, sorry, not going there, and then can see what's uh, coming next. So, uh, I wanted to look at the raster protocol, and then I encountered another security mechanism, which I call security by paywall, because a raster norm costs you 128 euros. Usually you find someone who's willing to pay that for you, most likely your um, employer. And now we can look at the protocol after we paid the 128 euros. And then we have a redundancy layer and a Sicherheits- and retransmission layer. So a redundancy layer has some header, some data, and a cyclic redundancy code. Nothing interesting there. But the Sicherheits- and retransmission layer provides you uh, with the Sicherheitscode. Cool. Let's look at the Sicherheitscode. It's an MD4 with an initialization vector and options. Okay, let's look at the options. Option one, uh, no, um, yeah, option one is a zero byte Sicherheitscode. <laughs> and it must be used if one of the communication partners is not safety critical. So the safety integrity level zero indicates it's not safety critical. Um, okay, no security. Option two is the standard option. We have an eight byte Sicherheitscode. And it's the first half of an MD4. We already know that MD4 is vulnerable to collision attacks. And we do have certain degrees of freedom in the messages. If we only use eight bytes um, instead of the 16 bytes of MD4, it gets even more vulnerable to a collision. Um, and then we have option three, which is the full MD4, um, but that's also vulnerable to pre-image attacks. So if you know the hash algorithm, and we know it's MD4, um, and you know the hash value, which you can just read out, then you can calculate back to the initialization vector. And if you have the initialization vector, you can just use that to well, kind of sign any message you have. And then there's something else, and was also pointed out in a paper by Heinrich et al. Um, if the implementation follows the example given in the raster norm, then the initialization vector will not have 60 random bytes, but only eight. And the other eight are just taken from the norm, like the standardized initialization vector. And that might make it even easier to break something there. Well, to be honest, if you look in the RFC 1320, it also tell, already tells you that you might not want to use MD4 for, well, there's no reason against it. By the way, that's from 1992, uh, implementing very high security digital signature scheme, but it was designed to be exceptionally fast. Um, it is at the edge in terms of risking successful cryptanalytic attacks. But to be honest, the rare people, they also state in their raster norm that the communication via open networks threatened by unauthorized access is out of scope. So raster was never intended to do any security. And we can imagine like raster is this really nice fence around a house. And it's very successfully having for the last year prevented anybody accidentally stepping on our flower beds. And then someone came and said, oh cool, I already have that fence, I wanna be more secure against burglars, so I'm going to lock the fence. That's not how the burglar thinks. So adding security later will not work. Security by futurization is not a good idea. Okay, so we have encountered a lot of security mechanisms, but what's actually happening if we talk to them and we tell them that we want to do security? So usually the communication goes like this. We say, okay, please do security. And he says, 
okay, I'm now convinced I need security, I'm going to use the MD4 or SHA-256 or whatever you want. And we say, oh no, you cannot use the MD4. Um, what's missing in this conversation is the misconceptions the railway engineer might have. And I had the luck to speak to a couple of railway engineers in the, uh, three months ago, and I learned when they hear security, they hear we want them to do cryptography. And when they hear cryptography, they think, what was that again? Something to do with email encryption. They want me to encrypt my stuff. And then they think, okay, encryption algorithms, uh, yeah, SHA-256, I heard that one before. So we're doing a pretty bad job at explaining to them what we really want them to do. Because I never understand why they should encrypt. You can see whether the point is moving or whether the train is moving or stopping. And we don't want them to encrypt. We want them to do integrity protection in most cases. So we have here really, we have a problem uh, in explaining to them what the goals are. And that's sad because most likely we have a common goal. We want to have safe and secure railways running very efficiently and we can just go to a holidays or transport goods because it's a great way of transport. It's very convenient, very fast and environment friendly. And we also must not forget that they also have expertise. They know how to keep the system safe. And we know how to make the system secure. So it would be great um, if we could use that. And actually, that's already happening. So a new security standard is coming up for railways. And it's based on some proven operational technology security standard. And it actually provides static and dynamic requirements. So we're, at, we're moving away from this. We fix it 30 years ago, and then it has to work. But we can start to change things. We're taking that into account now. Then we have, uh, we're moving from the communication via UDP to communication via TLS. I mean, I just said that we don't really care about encryption, but obviously we want to have security in depth. We want to have every layer secured, and if we uh, encrypt the layers, not everything is readable anymore. And then there's also um, some best practices. So the ULINX standard security service, and I'm not sure whether I mentioned ULINX before, so it's the European um, so they're moving towards more standardized interfaces uh, and everything that's basically U-Links, or one of them is U-Links, and that contains public key infrastructure, uh, identity and access management things, backup, so yeah, things we already know. So please try to work together with them, try to learn each other's language a little bit, and just be excellent to each other. Thank you. Thanks, Katja, for this nice talk. Um, I would be almost uh, alert to ask you where you got those nice images from, the, the <laughs> head drawings. They're cool. But let's, let's keep that aside. Do we have internet questions? Not yet. You can line up at the yeah microphones. Microphone number one, please. Hi, Katja. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question concerning your basic assumption that would be that the security is needed to uh, ensure a safe operation, but aren't there any systems in place that are kind of redundant that also stop a train once the communications is uh, hacked? Yeah, basically, so safety is ensured and the safe state for a train is just to stop. So. Um, <laughs> So usually uh, the railway engineers is uh, happy if the train just stops. But we also want to move into this, please provide, uh, so the going on with the operation. Yeah, but, it, but the biggest fail is uh, passengers being pissed, but not passengers being dead, right? Yes. Okay, that's, thank that's you. That's our first goal. <laughs> okay, uh, microphone number two. 
Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, like, when MD4 appeared on that screen, I think a bunch of the crypto people in this room were cringing a bit. Um, and I was wondering, is this a... It is insecure because the standard is that old, or is it an it is insecure because we didn't know better? And if it's the latter, you mentioned uh, learn each other's languages. Um, how can we make sure in those standardization committees that this kind of expertise is there when it's needed? So, question was why was MD4 in the standard in the first place? Well, and, and how to get the expertise into the standardization committees. I, I think part of that is already happening. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'd be glad if I get more people interested in, in uh, doing security for railways because I think it's a really cool field. Um, and I think we, we need more people uh, with, with also the IT security expertise in the field. Um, so I, I think it's it's already partially happening that people are moving there, um, and MD4 at that time <laughs> it, it might be seen like a good idea, and they didn't follow the idea that you use more proven cryptography, um, and actually they choose something very recent. I don't know why they did that. Thanks. Okay, microphone number four. Hi, uh, thank you for presentation. I'm in cybersecurity of the trains for the last five years. We do pen testing of the trains and I can confirm that your cases are not anecdotal. You can actually steal the train. We physically did that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the first part. Uh, second part, uh, what is your view um, let's say for, last, for next 10 years. Is it going to be better or worse? And then I will tell my opinion. <laughs> I'm a very optimistic person, so I hope it's getting better. <laughs> yeah, that what we do not share. <laughs> Actually, I do believe in uh, next five years it will be much worse because of the convergence because the OT and IT systems are now nearly the same and the, and the new trains we're testing are just the running data centers. It's, it's data centers on the rails. But after some big shit happening, I believe it will get better. Yeah, yeah usually, unfortunately, uh, you need the big shit first, uh, yeah. but then yeah. it moves faster. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the insights. Uh, microphone number three, please. So you mentioned TLS, but isn't that just security by tunneling legacy protocols over crypto, basically, um, and not really security by design. Well, basically, currently we're using UDP, um, or a lot of UDP, and um, I think that TLS gives you just another line of defense if you cannot just easily decrypt the, um, the lowest layer. Um, but yeah, you, you still have the other legacy protocols going there. Thanks. Okay, now microphone number one, please. Uh, hi, earlier you were talking about a euro key that you were extracting. Is this a key that's uh, rotated or is this one key forever in every device? Um, uh, the euro radio key. Euro radio key, yeah. Um, actually, that's a session key. So you also, if you want to, to do that attack, uh, like really do that attack, you also have to take into account that the session change and so on. So that makes it a little bit harder uh, to crack. There's some, some fixed key, then they calculate the session key, and that one you can extract part of that. So it's not too bad, just part of an attack. Thanks. Microphone number four, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, the new standards you uh, mentioned, do you know of any efforts to uh, add future proof um, encryptions, changeovers? Like, uh, for now, the new uh, encryption and algorithms we consider safe, but in the future, maybe we want to change them again. So, this MD5. Uh, MD4 problem that we now have, we maybe have in the future with SA or something like this. Um, 
I mean, I didn't check in the standards, but I think, yes, they do. That's what I understand under the aesthetic and dynamic requirements. And uh, industry is discussing that and taking into account that you need to be able to uh, also switch to newer uh, cryptography algorithms. So they are aware. Okay, now microphone number three, please. I would like just to comment on the MD4 topic. Um, that's mainly because the implementation of this algorithm is necessary to be done in the safety processor with a special operating system and so on. And people tend to go for easy implementation of algorithms instead of doing shard, just doing MD4 because it has to be validated, certified afterwards. That's the main reason why MD4 was picked. And the IV is just used to separate interlocking sections from one another. And on the TLS topic, I would like to comment that I think that's the most sophisticated protocol we have right now um, for end-to-end -end security. And um, in the end, what is HTTPS doing there? It's doing a, using a very old protocol, just wrapping security around it, and then everybody's using it for online banking or yeah, hopefully in the future also for your health records instead of yeah, whatever the guys come up with. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, the internet has woken up. The internet is asking, uh, you mentioned the session key. How long is the session? Um, I'm not sure. Sorry, I cannot answer that. I, I think in the paper they mentioned something that it's different and that it's a couple of days. Okay. Something that can be read probably somewhere. Okay, microphone number one. Uh, thanks. Coming from the other side, as the colleague before, also in OT, we've been deploying um, IDS systems, mainly in like Nozomi, Dragos, Clarity, you name it, um, directly at the train, because as you said, they're like moving data centers already. Um, my question to you would be, have you talked to the rail guys or like what's your insight on this afterthought basically or like you just monitor the trains and not really the system right like it's a local solution to a global problem so what would be your your insight on this on how to tackle this i'm sorry for me a train is basically just a big black box because they have so many different equipment in there that it's at least as complex as the rest of the system, especially if they, for example, go cross-border, they need to be equipped for all of the different uh, in-use standards. So um, for me, train and track side are completely different worlds. <laughs> also, they, I, I cannot really say much about that. So would it be feasible to have some kind of European train cert or something where you have like a global or like a European SOC? Because it's just monitoring, right? Yeah, but currently, I mean, the, since the network has been growing over years and over uh, decades, you still have all of these old protocols and, and completely different technologies in use. Um, I don't. Th I think that's like really a problem or that makes it also so very special because we're, we're now trying to move into a more standardized approach and if you have standardized traffic, it's, uh, I guess, um, much easier to, to monitor that. Um, but with, with this fragmented network, I don't see how that would be feasible currently. I'd hope like we see rollout of... Um, of the Euling standard that at some point you'd, you'd start to at least start to monitor the, the newer communication parts of the system. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, next question, microphone number four, please. Thanks first for the great talk. <laughs> so I have two questions. First of all, yesterday and during the year, several um, 
um, breaks of the Tetra um, uh, protocol had been shown, so I know that uh, as critical infrastructure railway system was affected also by it. So do you know by such cases and how do you uh, mitigate it? It's my first question. The second one, um, I'm also busy in uh, um, standards and uh, regularization part in another area, but I know of the challenges, so I would be curious to know about these dynamic requirements. How do you want to verify that these uh, dynamic um, are um, hold, really? Thanks. Okay, thanks for the question. So, first question was uh, about the Tetra, uh, attacks on Tetra network and how that's affecting railway. Sorry, I have no clue. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, sorry, the, the network is really huge, so I have to say I'm, my, my knowledge is like limited to... Okay. <laughs> One area, um, and the second question was how how you do about dynamic requirements and standards. I think it's basically forward referencing another standard and uh, ensuring in the standard that you say for your product you need to be equipped with the option to uh, change cryptography, and your cryptography options, for example, are written in the actual current standard from most likely NIST. Um, Something okay. like this. But then the obligation is lost, you know. Then you refer to another one and then uh, you're gone. So this I wanted to know. It, that's the answer. Standardization has its own legal yeah. problems. Okay, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. We're getting close to the closing time, actually. Um, I cannot really admit more questions, but Katja is going to be available. You can talk to her, I'm sure, outside somewhere, and continue the lively discussion we had here. But now, for now, big applause for Katja again. Thanks. <laughs>